Uh, the other key point to note about the corporate offence is its jurisdictional scope. Um, again, under the existing law, um, the UK legislation catches UK persons, um, UK individuals, um, doing acts anywhere in the world, and also UK companies, um, what, wherever they are in the world. But what the corporate offence will do will also be to catch uh, overseas companies which carry out business or part of their business in the UK. They'll then be within the scope of the offence in relation to all their conduct worldwide. To give a, a sort of slightly extreme example, if you had a French company which has a branch office in England, not a separately incorporated subsidiary but a branch in England, uh, an employee of the French company goes off to Nigeria and pays a bribe in Nigeria to win a bit of business which is booked to France. Um, that conduct is in, within the scope of the UK Bribery Act, even though um, there's no UK nexus, there's no UK individuals involved, there's no money flowing through the UK or anything of that sort. Now, there's an interesting question as to whether in that case UK law enforcement are going to be it's going to be very high up their agenda in terms of investigation uh, because there would be clearly practical difficulties with evidence and um, individuals and witnesses being abroad. So possibly they may go for lower hanging fruit in the UK in the first instance. But the scope of the act is that broad um, and does catch, uh, I think, uh, it does reach broader than a lot of companies realise at the moment and therefore it becomes necessary really to look at your group structure and think about um, the relationships between the different companies, um, which companies have operations in the UK, they're going to be caught, um, which companies are uh, UK companies which have people overseas performing services for them, they're going to be caught, um, where do you have a lot of um, individuals who are uh, British citizens working on an expat basis abroad, they're going to be caught as well. And one of the big strategic decisions for companies at the moment is how far you roll out your policies and procedures. Do you try and do it on an organisational-wide basis? Or are there um, real difficulties in terms of applying UK standards in overseas jurisdictions, um, for example, in the area of facilitation payments? Um, and if that's the case, uh, is it possible to say that particular subsidiaries are outside the scope of the Act? Uh, and as a matter of policy, would you want to exempt them in any event? Um, and that brings me briefly on to mention um, facilitation payments, because no talk about the Act would be, I think, complete without them. This is a very odd area, because it's something that law enforcement, again, are not that interested in uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We're talking here about routine uh, grease payments, which are paid... Um, to try and get a public official to do something he should have done anyway. So getting you through, getting your goods through customs, getting individuals through customs, getting bits of licenses stamped, getting your telephone connected, that sort of thing, routine low-level payments. There is a specific carve-out um, in the FCPA in relation to um, those sorts of payments, and therefore a lot of companies have anti-corruption procedures at the moment um, which permit them. Under UK law, um, the thinking has always been that they were probably illegal. Um, the government guidance on that has shifted over the last 10 years. It used to be they might be illegal, but we're not going to prosecute them. Um, and it's now much clearer um, that the government really thinks that these things should be prohibited. Um, and because of the scope of the Bribery Act, it's now much clearer that they are, uh, they are caught. Um, and in particular, the main bribery offence what's called case two of that offence, um, is committed where you offer a payment or advantage and you know or believe that it would be improper for the recipient to take that advantage, to receive that advantage. Uh, and that's almost always going to be the case because it will almost always be the case um, when you pay a facilitation payment that the recipient is not allowed under local law um, to receive it. And as I said, this gives rise to a challenge in terms of, in practice, what do you do about facilitation payments where you perceive them as needing to be paid in or commonly being paid in overseas jurisdictions? Do you put in place a blanket ban? Uh, it's something we've seen. Um, do you say, uh, we strongly discourage them, but local subsidiaries 
um, are allowed to come up with their own policies, providing they comply with local law. Uh, that's something we've also seen. Do you say uh, local subsidiaries um, specifically are allowed to pay them? Are you silent on the point? Um, I think clearly if you have any policy which says that these things specifically can be paid, um, I think gives rise to uh, potential difficulties under the Bribery Act because you are effectively agreeing to conduct um, which would be unlawful under UK law. Um, so that's, again, that's not really a change, but it is a change in emphasis and a change in government attitude. Um, and that brings me on to my final point, which I shall do in, in about a minute flat, um, which is not really a point about the Bribery Act, but a, a point about the enforcement climate generally. In terms of what's changed from a practice standpoint, yes, there are differences in the scopes of, scope of the anti-corruption regime which need to be reflected in policies and procedures. But really the reason why this all matters is that we are beginning to see in the UK a track record of enforcement. We had a pretty broad anti-corruption regime previously. It was a bit patchwork. There were some problems with it, but actually we had a reasonable set of offences there. But simply no one was prosecuted. Uh, but we're now seeing a new will for that to happen, both from the Serious Fraud Office uh, in terms of the criminal offences and from the FSA in terms of the regulatory requirement to have anti-corruption systems and controls. And therefore, really, we've gone from a place where this was a, a theoretical risk to actually being a real risk um, if companies get it wrong. Um, and on that note, I think my 15 minutes are up. Thank you.